the current uh, moment that we've been uh, living. So uh, for, for me, for example, COVID was uh, a, a way to kind of not, not, not to just realize the fragility of our world and uh, ecosystems, but also to think uh, about the fact that um, the, the architectures, the, how we construct uh, ideas and systems and uh, education, everything maybe is not ideal for everyone. It hasn't been working uh, in, in the right way. So, so I'm really pleased to have uh, these brilliant uh, people here today, Cassia, Joan and Victoria, to, to talk about, their, to share their practices uh, in the first part and then uh, to join in a conversation um, for the, for the second part uh, of, the, of the session today. And just to very briefly say, so this event is uh, in collaboration with Ars Electronica and it starts the European Programme for Science, Technology and the Arts and University for the Creative Arts. And um, also uh, just to say that we want all of you to, uh, to be involved and to hear your ideas and comments and questions and to join the conversation. It's, uh, it, 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 it's really, it's of course, it's not the same to not be in the same room together, but um, it's great that we can, we can uh, join uh, everybody uh, here in, uh, in a virtual space. So uh, I would uh, like to ask you to, uh, if you have any questions throughout the session, please use the, the Q&A um, functionality in, at the bottom of the, of the Zoom uh, screen. And also, please feel free to use the chat uh, to, to say hello, to say who you are, where you're joining from, to post any comments. And uh, also, if you are sharing uh, any bit of the conversation uh, on social, uh, on Twitter, uh, you can see the hashtags of our speakers um, on, the, on the screen now. So, so the way that this uh, is going to work, uh, I'm going to to invite uh, Cassia first to, uh, and then uh, Victoria and Joan to share, uh, to, to give us an, a snippet of their studio, of their um, creative practices and how they engage with, uh, with ecologies, but also with these kind of uh, tiny uh, worlds that we often, and uh, other species that we often don't think about. To, to, to share their thoughts about what is happening right now, about um, yeah, what happens next and how they've been uh, managing uh, this time and how they've been responding. And then we are going to move into uh, the conversation. So uh, Cassia, Victoria and Joan, welcome. And it's so great to have you here. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. And uh, Cassia, I'm going to um, yeah, move to you and you can share your screen and uh, yeah. And tell Wonderful. us all about Thank your you amazing so work. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Okay, let me just uh, share the screen. Share. Wonderful. I'm going to switch my video so I'm not getting distracted. If I can find it. <laughs> All right. Okay, so um, thank you very much, first of all, Irini, for um, this amazing invitation. And uh, it is such a privilege to be in the company of such amazing practitioners. And I hope that everybody has a very lovely morning today. Um, so um, I will present a little bit um, background um, about my practice and then a few thoughts on the current situation. Um, Right, how do I change? Oh, here we go. Um, <clears throat> I um, very often use uh, that quote from Felix Guattari, the tree ecologist, to contextualize my work um, because I think it beautifully encapsulates um, what I'm trying to do um, through my practice. But also I think right now today and very particularly for this morning, um, it, provides a, it provides a very nice angle. <clears throat> 
Um, so humans and non-humans are um, inherently and intrinsically interconnected. And to summarize the core of what I do is um, that I create a, a set of stories or narratives in various forms about those interconnections. And I look at emerging and fashionable technologies, which um, usually are very human centered and try to human uncenter it. And, and I do that in order to amplify the presence um, of the uh, uh, aforementioned non-human, or I call it non-human makers, that is organisms and processes uh, which constitute a life on this planet. Um, and I create situations, interactive installations, immersive performances, and audiovisual work through which I hope to pose the question whether we are able and whether we are willing to treat um, and consider so-called nature as a partner and collaborator rather than the product. Um, uh, uh, the product um, and the resource um, which uh, we keep exploiting and capitalizing on for the benefit of governing human. And um, effects of that we have been witnessing very vividly in the recent months. Um, I want to stop here for a second as well. And um, I want to explain why when I use the word nature, I also paired it with the phrase um, so-called. That is because I am not really a fan of this word of nature um, because of its historical connotations. Um, you know, this word is historical construction that establishes a sort of uh, illusory division between human and non-human beings. And <clears throat> nature as such is perceived through this idea of the fourth wall, which is this concept in theater where um, there is an invisible screen or a wall dividing people audience from people actors. Um, and that is usually how um, the nature is sort of sold to us as a, and, and it is portrayed as a given, as somewhere something very majestic and pure outside our everyday lives, where we go for a weekend to relax, which further reinforces this idea, uh, the, the idea of disconnection from the environment. Um, it will be impossible to frame subject of this conversation without a comment on COVID. And I want to say a couple of things about it. Um, during the lockdown, I observed calls from various corners of um, mass and social media to re re reconnect with nature. And that was because um, some people had more time. Also, the, the noisiness of human productivity was gone, and we could hear birds more clearly, animals becomes less shy, and they came to um, roam around cities and towns. But on the other hand, the screen time took over. And um, this mediated through the streams as now, for example, a pixelated two dimensional sense limited experience become more prevalent, which while I heard so many voices agreeing how amazing was that first part of, of going out and observing nature, we all still got somehow swallowed um, by the screen becoming a sort of global digitized experience of ourselves which again reinforced that aforementioned fourth wall and, and, and also the, the concept of umwelt or rather impossibility of getting out of it. Um, and umwelt is something which I'm really interested in. Um, for example, while COVID made us feel a bit endangered and perhaps forced us to think about our interconnections with other, other species, and how our um, actions affect everything around, I wonder whether it might um, help us to empathize, empathize and in a way put ourselves in the position of our species and whether technology can be repurposed to help us achieve that. And so um, I'm going to introduce two works which um, although were made before COVID, I feel are very relevant to, to the situation right now. And the first one is called Coral Love Story. Um, and it is about um, hacking some of um, very recently, recently very trendy wearable technologies in order to evoke more empathy to corals and sort of intimacy with them because um, not only that there are different type of species but also they live in totally different habitats. Um, and also it is about how to utilize our networked world in such a way so we could feel connected to a life, but um, 
um, very remote and far away from us, um, fellow Earthlings. And the work was developed in collaboration with uh, Sakura scientists, uh, coral scientists from Sakura Foundation and uh, scientists from the Deep Aquarium in Hull and commissioned by Invisible Dust. And um, in coral lobster, I use wearable as sort of a, a transmitter so that the wearer can physically feel whatever corals might feel, to my best knowledge and my best interpretation, that is. Um, and the wearable attempts to bring the presence closer to us and make it more intimate. The wearable is capable of reacting in real time to coral bleaching alerts. And to clarify, I'm sure that most of you know what it is. Um, during these alerts, uh, basically the water becomes warmer and there is too much acid in the water. And that obviously causes a huge distress in a delicate uh, ecosystem of, of coral reefs. And, um, and then they, they start to die. So when there is a bleaching alert, this uh, wearable can inform people around the wearer uh, because the pattern on the wearable becomes transparent, just like corals itself becomes transparent during the coral bleaching. And also it can be felt physically by a wearer because it becomes warmer, like the water in the ocean. And there are also uh, a little vibrations um, transmitted through a tiny, uh, vibration motors symbolizing the stress uh, which are embedded in the wearable. Uh, it is possible to know um, about the bleaching alerts thanks to the uh, sensors from eight scientific stations scattered around Great Barrier Reef transmitting data from Pacific Ocean in um, near re real time. And another project which I would like to talk about is uh, a project which I did uh, as a part of my STARS residency with Grove Observatory, um, and it took almost two years from 2007. Uh, the collaboration took almost two years from 2007 until 2019. Um, and the Grove Observatory was European Horizon 2020 consortium of 18 universities and eight grow places and hundreds of growers. And their task was to monitor soil moisture and conditions of European soils in the context of droughts and the current climate change. Um, oh, I don't know why this part of the slide is not showing up. There are beautiful satellite images on uh, uh, the uh, right hand side, but sadly you have to imagine it. Um, so Grow Observatory are using around 15,000 of soil moisture sensors, which, is scat which, which are scattered across um, Europe. And the growers were acquiring data from the grow places and transmitting this data to the central database where from, from where scientists could access it. Scientists then use this data collected from the ground to validate the data from the Sentinel-1A satellite, which goes around the world, zapping, sort of zapping the surface with the rate of light in order to take an image of the moisture of a surface. So it was kind of micro visa macro using citizen observatory for the validation of highly specialized scientific imagery taken from space. The objective was to see whether we can manage soil more effectively in the future. And I have to say it was one of the hardest but most interesting residences I took part in. And one of the works I did as a part of it, um, I did two actually, um, is called By the Code of Soil. Uh, which was created in collaboration with the uh, um, sound uh, uh, artist Robin Rimbaud, aka Scanner, and produced by Future Everything. Um, and the reason why I want to talk about the By the Code of Soil is because it is a sort of virus. <laughs> it's a friendly, I cannot stress enough, it's a friendly computer virus, or as um, uh, my producer from Future Everything at that time was saying, don't use virus, don't use the word virus, it's a networked artwork, distributed network artwork. Anyway, um, this friendly computer virus, which was activated on participating users' computer um, when a satellite Sentinel-1A passed by user's location, launched a sort of audiovisual animation, uh, which um, took over the user's computer for around two minutes. Um, 
And so the software also created a sort of data portrait and data sound bites of the individual grow places because the data was coming in almost near time from grow sensors from from the lands closest to users locations and in different times the manifestations of the virus was always different so users couldn't really get the same video um, uh, twice it was always a little bit different and so by the code of soil is a story in a way um, in in which iot internet of things devices are hacked that was actually inspired by a real event of mirai botnet um in uh, i think 2011 exploiting the insecure internet of things devices um by two guys who were playing who were, who were playing some network game and they basically used it to to make sure that they win and those devices are taken over by nature, so itself, which decided to send to people reminders about its existence and importance. And now looking back at this work, which funnily enough premiered also as a movie on a big screen in Santa Quot in Paris in the end of February, just before the lockdown, I feel that there is a direct comparison to real life virus and what the, the coronavirus, you know, the whole situation forced us to do, that is to stop for a moment, stand still, uh, maybe observe and reflect and remind humans about existence of the world outside of our own world. Um, I want to show you quickly a little animation, a bit of the excerpt of the, from the movie. There is also a sound, obviously, but um, I don't know if uh, I can uh, properly um, show it via Zoom right now. Um, if we have a little bit of the time still, um, I would like to also talk a little bit about a work which I am doing uh, as a part of my residency in Ars Electronica um, for IMAP Imare residencies, which is called How to Make an Ocean. And if I may, the movie um, about ideas behind the process and creation will be screened on two channels of Ars Electronica Festival tomorrow and on Saturday on Voyage channel and I think Ars Electronica selection channel. But to summarize it, um, the whole project is about loss and mourning whether for our loved departed or environmental loss and anxiety and uncertainty and feeling powerless and importance of acknowledging um, those feelings. And it's about tears resulting from these emotions, which are, as far as we know, only char characteristic to humans, but which have a lot of benefits for feeling loss and grief and uncertainty because they help us to detoxify, uh, provide relief, and according to psychologists and scientists, they help us to provide mental clarity. Um, and also my questions within the project, within this project are whether there is a space in our technologically orientated realm for such emotions, for showing our fragility and vulnerability, which often is fueled by technology itself, for example, by AI curated news headlines or social media feeds. A um, few couple of, uh, like a year ago, my, my uh, social media feeds were full of absolutely paralyzing, um, breaking news headlines, and um, which kind of left me felt absolutely, well, powerless. And so in this project, I collect my own tears and investigate whether I can grow and cultivate marine species, such as ph phytoplankton, various types of algae, tiny fish, maybe even microscopic corals in my own tears, and whether the reason for crying would change the ecosystem and what are the stimuli which can make me and other uh, people to cry in order to feed my tiny ocean naturally. So it is about making something productive out of this sense of anxiety, sadness, and nostalgia. While we know that humans are destroying environment, I want to see whether we can also somehow help to heal it and create it. And that's the last slide I'm going to um, finish on uh, talking uh, a little bit about nostalgia. I use this word nostalgia, and I think I need to finish on this. 
<clears throat> so during the lockdown, I had this nostalgia to times pre-devices where the experience of the environment and non-human makers was undistracted. And so I realized that a big part of my own anxiety is coming from my huge FOMO or fear of missing out of these pure experiences. I recently read the book Rewild Yourself by Simon Burns, where the author quite rightly said that a technology, however amazing it is, is somewhat depriving us of the first time see experiences too, because before we see things in real life, we already know them from the screen. And so how to make an ocean and also I, I think other work is a sort of comment on that by creating my own tiny oceans. I want to recreate those first time experiences, a sense of awe when one really feel connected to something else embedded and embraced while embracing it with all our senses. And I guess also here comes this word uncertainty to play not only um, that at the moment we don't know whether we will be able to experience certain things, but um, because of the travel, social interaction and economical and naturally healthcare landscapes are shifting right now big time. We also know that the world as we know is disappearing and I don't only mean the way we live, but, but most importantly animals, insects, plants, fungi, you know, and the whole sixth extinction. Um, and I don't really have any conclusions here. Um, I just feel that there is this very weird moment right now where we are all homebound and screen tight, <clears throat> which is becoming our main avenue of experience. But um, there is this kind of negotiations of this pos position um, between real and, and screen base. And, and I feel it's very extremely, it's, it's extremely difficult to handle. Anyway, I'm going to stop now and stop sharing screen. Thank you so much, Cassia. That was uh, that was great. And uh, as you were saying, like it resonates so much with uh, what we've been going through. But also, I love how your work reminds us of like the other perspectives, like non-human perspectives, and uh, engages with like other species and creatures. Uh, and I'm, I I totally agree with what you were saying with your closing slide about nostalgia. I'm currently. I'm currently in, in Greece, in an island, uh, in the island of Andros, actually, in Cyclades, which is very close to uh, the other Irini, in, uh, one of our attendees who is, who is in, in Tinos Island. Mm -hmm. And it feels so weird to be um, like almost in between two different worlds, like the, the world of, of the screen. And it's the, it's the first time after like 20 years that I've been here, I've been spending here so long and also a world of wilderness that I don't often experience and I feel so distant from. And it makes me think about like connection and disconnection as well that we were talking about. And I'm sure Victoria and Joanne are going to talk about as well as you are touching uh, in. So uh, the, Kathy uh, Newberry has a, a question um, for you, but I wonder if we should keep this for for a bit later because uh, um, her question is really interesting and also I'm sure it relates to Victoria's practice as well so I'll just I'll keep it there for now I hope it's okay Kathy and we'll we'll get back to it so um with uh, yeah with having said having said that uh, thank you Kasia and Victoria do you want to share your screen and uh, yeah just tell us more about your amazing practice and cool, some yeah. exciting work thanks Irini again thank you so much for inviting me to do this it's really lovely to be in this room with you all. And like, thanks Cassia, your work is really inspiring. I'm aware of your work, but it was a real like pleasure to sit and listen, hear you talk about your process. <laughs> um, so thank you. Um, let me just share my screen. Okay, I will also just turn my video off, if that's okay with everyone. One sec. Hmm. Maybe I can't do it. Okay, fine. I can't work out to turn my video off, but that's fine. I'll leave it on. <laughs> so, um, first of all, I just wanted to do a, a little introduction to who I am, just um, in case people aren't aware of um, invisible flocks practice. So my name is Victoria and I'm an artist. I'm also creative director of Invisible Flock. Um, like I say, we're a studio, so we're a collective of artists based in Yorkshire. We're based at the Yorkshire Sculpture Park. 
and cross-disciplinarity and collaboration is, is really central to everything we do. Our work is primarily concerned with environments and specifically around long-form understandings of ecosystems. And we're looking to listen and understand like the layers of complexity and different modes of living within landscapes, asking what is our relationship to these ecosystems, both historically and currently. Um, today in this talk, I'm going to talk primarily about our processes um, and our field work that we undertake and how we create our work. But I just wanted to quickly show um, two types of outputs that we're known for um, and are really good examples of the importance of both collaboration, but also research in what we do. Um, so the first work on the left is a digital work called Out From The Flood, which visualizes live environmental data that's fed from a Lanka research station in Northern Finland. Um, it's, it's live and ongoing at the moment. Um, and we designed this as a, a mechanism to try and embody the vast amount of research that's undertaken at that site currently, but for the past, also for the past 50 years to now. And um, I mentioned this work because it's what we're calling a process piece. So it's live for audiences now, but it's not finished. It, it, it launched, but it's not launched. Um, and it won't finish anytime soon. It's, it's, it's a durational work and it's designed as a live dialogue with this scientific research station. And it's going to evolve dramatically just as we're about to move into the Finnish winter. And the second work on the right is a, an example of the larger scale installation work that we do. Uh, called Aurora and this was a piece about our global relationship to water and through using a, a huge amount of water as a material but also um, technology to kind of drive data and, in, and meld and interpret and push the water and um, we were trying to ask what is our what is this primal connection to water that perhaps we've lost um, and again it's it's a really good example this work was made with 15 international collaborators um, from different disciplines. That tends to be how we, how we create. So um, Invisible Blog, we've always used technology to allow us to actualize our ambitions or what we feel are sometimes seemingly impossible ideas. And for us, what the technology uh, is or how we intend to use it always starts with a challenge or a question. Um, so quite often there won't be an off the shelf solution. So we tend to develop hybrids to meet the needs of what we want to do. So this is the open field recorder and it's a really good example of this. So our challenge with this was how can we hear environments over a long duration with as little human presence as possible. And there are a couple of off the shelf products that do this kind of environmental recording like the audio moth or the solo. Um, which people might know, but these didn't allow us to do a couple of things. So they didn't allow us to plug in higher quality microphones, um, specifically stereo microphones such as DPA 4060s. They didn't uh, allow for the use of a rechargeable battery, which for us equated to more waste. And um, they didn't have a GPS sync um, that allowed us to sync the recorders across a site, which I'll explain a bit more in a bit. Um, so what we ended up doing is we used a Sony Spresence board coupled with our own custom phantom power circuit and a GPS reader as hardware solutions and in-house we developed our own code base to record constantly across multiple devices and this is all available for anyone who's interested on our github uh, if you'd like to make your own. Um, so the first open field recorder experiment for us was last year, uh, last summer. And it was a 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer area of Sumatran rainforest that we recorded. So Sumatra, as I'm sure most of you know, is one of our great biodiversity hotspots. And it's the only place where you still get tigers, rhinos, elephants, orangutans in the wild. Um, so what we did is we placed 10 of these recorders out in the jungle for three months. Um, like I said, across a 10 by 10 space. And we GPS synced each of the recorders so that they were time stamped and recording in sequence so that the sound could later be played back in a large spatial sound installation. So it's three months of audio, 20 sound channels covering 10 kilometers of jungle. And crucial, again, collaboration. We worked with local rangers and NGOs on this project, as well as researchers at Bournemouth University to place and monitor the recorders, but the aim was uh, with the sound could later be coupled with the machine learning process uh, to take this huge mass catalog of sound and try and identify different primates or species returning to and using that habitat. 
And the habitat we mapped ranged from um, areas of most human contact, so local villages, through to kind of the depths of the national park where you, you still need licenses to access it. And over the duration that the, the boxes were out, the recorders were out, um, we also had camera traps, also time stamped. So here we begin to start to see them being explored. So this is a cheeky macaque uh, taking a selfie. Um, this is a critically endangered marching elephant. It's approximately 2,000 left in the world. And a video of them passing for you. they just keep coming which is kind of incredible um, and this one is particularly special this if we're really lucky to get this was a Sumatran tiger it's extremely rare there's only 400 of these left in the world in the wild uh, the second experiment for the AFRs is taking place currently and it could not be in a, a, a more different climate uh, again this is northern Finland um, so Finland uh, is a country of 10% water and 69% forest, and it has over 188,000 water bodies. And uh, annually, the whole country undergoes a seasonal freeze and, and a flood. Uh, so the landscape is dramatically transformed. Lichens get covered by snowfall. The trees become these big anthropomorphic forest creatures, towering over with the weight of the snow. Uh, and as the lakes freeze, um, they generate this really piercing sound, almost like a lightsaber. So we asked ourselves, what does the country freezing sound like from the perspective of those trees? What does it sound like from under the ice? And what does it sound like deep within the forest? Um, so this is just this week in a Lanka research station, again, our partner on this. Um, we've got the 10 recorders sitting out with contact microphones strapped to the trees to listen to them as it freezes and hydrophones in the lakes. Um, and these are now ready to sit out for six to nine months. Um, of constant recording. I think we worked out today, it's gonna to be like 60 terabytes of data. So a crazy thing, but um, we also managed to adapt the recorders to be solar powered, which was really exciting. Um, uh, so yeah, unlike Sumatra, Finland, if you've been, is incredibly quiet out in the forest, almost it's eerily quiet. Um, and you don't tend to hear much or I haven't experienced much. So but again, when it's, um, when you disappear from this, as humans, um, all this life starts to appear. So this is a wolf. Um, you can sort of see in this video. A good friend of ours, uh, who's also a sound recordist, um, he told us that the greatest tool you have as a sound recordist is time. And I feel like what the EFRs have allowed us to do is use time as a medium in a way that we couldn't previously. Through this technology, we're able to consider our disappearance from these landscapes. We can imagine a time before human presence and we can imagine a future maybe after us. Again, the OFRs uh, were about to go out um, to Karnataka for mango season um, this year, March this year, but we had to postpone it due to the pandemic. Um, this is kind of a good example of also where we're at with them now. So this is a, a small village in Karnataka and it has an ongoing influx of elephants visiting and um, particularly around cropping season, uh, eating the crops, but also causing anxiety for the locals that, that live there. Um, and working with our friends Quicksand and Frontier Elephants, we wanted to explore whether the OFRs with a, a use of a long range or an infrasonic microphone could pick up the sounds of elephants before they reach the community farm border and act as an early warning signal for the villagers in some way. Both the safety of the elephant who is now roaming further as its habitats have decreased or migration routes have been blocked, 
but also for the villages who in some way have always lived with elephants, but are struggling with these new numbers that are now visiting. Um, our journey of, with elephants and sound began again back in Sumatra, and I just wanted to draw on an experience. Um, this is a baby elephant, Salma. Uh, she was rescued in 2019 from a trap by the brilliant NGO Forum Conservation Lusa. Um, what had happened to her is her foot had been snared in the forest and um, she couldn't move, so she, and she'd also fallen into a hole. I just want to warn you, this story, it doesn't end well. Um, Salma here, this is her at the conserva conservation unit earlier this year in February. She's with Leah and Nonnie, who are two other rescue elephants they have there. Um, Salma passed away a few days after this photograph was taken. So this is very common for orphaned elephants. Um, she was unable to get the nutrition that she needed from her mother's milk. And I, I show this slide because like Cassia, I think I wanted to talk about grief. Um, and elephants, uh, as you know, are hugely intelligent, complex beings. And one example of this I always return to is a story of an elephant, a daughter who every year on migration, she returns to the site of her mother's skull um, and she spends time touching it with her trunk um, and examining it and, and, and moves on. Um, so when I think about Salma's story, I think for me, I, I think about the moment, singular moment when her mother had to leave her snared in the forest. Um, the pain of knowing that there was nothing that she could do for her and that moment when she decided that she had to walk away. And this is not human pain, but it is a pain that we can recognize and it's a pain that we can feel deeply. And elephants, as, as we know, have been hunted almost to extinction. So it strikes me that they've long experienced the anxieties we are beginning to talk of in terms of ecological trauma and grief. And I think there's a lot that we can learn from their plight. And I also feel like we need to look directly at it and not turn away because it's hard to experience. And I think this is something at the moment I'm trying to do generally, which is this idea of to get to hope, you have to really fully, fully first confront despair. Um, and I just wanted to end on this quote um, by Robin Wall Kimmerer. Uh, so I'll just read it. The pandemic has had me great, thinking a great deal about what our species is experiencing could be an opening to imagining the threat and constriction that is the reality for so many other species, often at our hands. What about the grief in the chestnut blight or the salamander epidemics? The vulnerabilities we feel about our health and our community, our food supply and well-being, all those anxieties and vulnerabilities that we feel, if we set aside our human exceptionalism, we are now feeling what it is like to be biologically vulnerable. As I listen to the robin in the trees, I realize they are biologically vulnerable every single day. The constriction that we feel now, they feel every day as their habitat shrink. Um, and I just wanted to end on that slide. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you, Victoria. That was, um, yeah, I think that was brilliant. And uh, it's great to see how much um, time uh, as a team you have dedicated in like doing research in, in sites across the world. And I've always been fascinated about the stories that you bring back and how you present them. And, uh, and, and actually that's really interesting what uh, I've been thinking for like about Kathy's question as well in terms of, uh, and maybe I could ask it now for to both you and Cassia and before we, we move on to talk to Joanne. Uh, in terms of like how do we bring, uh, how do we uh, interpret these stories uh, back home and like how galleries and museums provide interpretation and interaction, which is something that I've been also thinking about and struggling with sometimes as a curator in terms of like how, yeah, just thinking about these spaces and how do we engage with these ideas that are, and, and uh, stories that are so far away from where we are at the moment, uh, but also like maybe just thinking about other environments, maybe just going outside museums, maybe going back to these environments and uh, creating uh, like, you know, engagement there. So it'd be great to hear like briefly from you and uh, Cassia, like, um, yeah, about this. Shall I start, Cassia? <laughs> Uh, I think it's a, it's a really interesting question. I think it's also, I'm really aware of the idea of not over 
exoticizing something or, you know, yeah, making it feel almost fantastical. It's how you take the, the realness of that situation and, and, and don't just make it into a magical, fantastical artwork. And I think, I think, I think about this a lot for, for me with these projects. I think duration is really important um, so that the audience are experiencing that sound over time. Like we're not editing the, the tiger, the elephant, you know, it's about how, how those spaces actually exist on a different time span to, the, to human time. And it is about slowness and experience. And the second thing I would say in terms of how we curate that for an audience, I think the collaborators' stories, the people on the ground, their stories, their voice within that exhibition is really, really important. Um, you almost want them to introduce it or, or, or bring you into it in some ways. So I think that's, that's what we're trying to do. Yeah, I, I, I would second that as well. And I would add as, uh, that what is important for its duration, also the space, the, the, the kind of physical space, but also the mental space to, to, to and accessibility, you know, um, to provide experiences. Um, and by space, I don't mean exactly the, the space in the museum, not, not exactly the white cube, but the space which we can create, you know, in all other spaces, you know, via network or outside or within the community. Um, uh, when we bring people together to experience the, the stories, the work and, and feed back to it. Um, but it, 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 yeah, there is not a single answer to this, gen, I suppose, and it also depends on the artwork and the story. And um, I know that my uh, work, I've been usually, my biggest struggle is to um, communicate stories to communities which normally go to the museums and um, and how to, you know, how to find the bridge, how to reach out, how to find them to experience, understand, and, um, you know, immerse themselves in, in the risk, as Victoria said, and, and the magic as well. Magic is very important here because magic can act as a sort of, um, not a seduction, but um, invitation and encouragement to experience something. <laughs> I hope Great. that answered the question a little bit. Great, thank you. Um, so, yeah, with that in mind, I just I want to um, invite Joanne to share her really interesting work with us, uh, coming from like a science, uh, but also community engagement background, and also I'm, it's something that you uh, th that both uh, Cassia and uh, Victoria. Uh, to, uh, told us about this idea of time and deep time and uh, Joanne is going to, to say a few, um, a little bit more about that because it's something that I find is really, uh, it, it's what most people kind of uh, uh, find challenging to understand and like how do we, re how, how do we even think about like the, the passage of time before we even existed on, on this planet and also what happens after we are here. So welcome, Joanne. Thank you, thank you. Can you see my screen okay? Um, yeah, okay, great. So good good, good morning, everybody. I, I have to admit that I feel very mildly intimidated. I'm possibly the only person on this panel who was told that she was going to fail her GCSE art. Um, so I, I'm excited to be speaking. I am a little nervous, but um, it's it's such an honor because I, this to hear these beautiful new ways of thinking about how to connect people to landscapes and to their 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 place in the world i've been thinking about what what is what is my role here what 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 do i do I, i'm an academic i teach the i teach planners i teach planners how to think about space what i really want to do is help people reimagine their place in the world so that we think about ecology and our ecology of place and we think how our human activities can fit within that ecology so that we can actually live within the world in a way that doesn't cause damage. So my work is almost like a future storyteller 
but possibly a future story listener to think about how to really understand our local ecology and then reimagine, for instance, here, this is a former coal mining site that's now turning into a natural flood management plain. How can we reimagine our landscape, our buildings, our human settlements so that they fit in within ecological systems so that we have a good place within the world? And I think it's all about our thinking about all of our human settlements, our buildings, how we move, how we interact with the landscape and reimagining that. But it has to be in place, in a particular place. So this idea of understanding deep time and the history and the interactions of humans with a place over time, what is it we've done to that landscape? Here's a coal mining field in Wigan. But how can we reimagine that so it can become an ecologically sound place? This is a, a more recent picture of those former coal mining. So I think this is a story of understanding and connection, but creating hope and vision. So some of the work I've been doing has been within the carbon landscape, which is the industrial, it's the landscape that fueled the industrial revolution. And I think a lot of what I do is try and get people to think of a longer time scale, both in terms of the history of a place, but what its future could be, but also expand its our sense of actual space, of our very local and particular, my garden, my house, my school, my neighborhood, my workplace, and how that fits into a larger landscape. And when I think of that, so that's the ecology. When I think about the technology of this practice, the technology I'm the most interested in is the technology of how we listen to people's stories, how we uncover our own understandings, our understanding of what works, of what we care about, what's working on our place, what we really want to keep, but also we reimagine and rethink what we could do in our landscapes, in our work, in our, in our schools. So here, for instance, is community members and stakeholders in the carbon landscape reimagining that future, starting to think of it as a bigger landscape, thinking of the connections and really starting to imagine what that could be like different. And it's so vital that everybody tells their story and understands their place in that and imagines their place in it to create a bigger, more connected picture. Now, obviously, with COVID, we are sort of slightly more fragmented and scattered, but we still need to do that and think about how it is we can imagine and discuss what we could do differently and how we can really think about larger scale change to really shift towards a sustainable future. And part of my practice is helping people think deeper into the past how that landscape got to be like it is and how this fits within a story of change so that they can really imagine and see their role in the formation of the landscape in the formation of new futures. Understanding our place in this, the incredible devastation that we've wrought within the seconds that we've been here within the story of the earth, but opening up the possibility and the option for change. So I think it's interesting when we talked about that idea of galleries and practice, a lot of what I'm interested in now is, is how do we bring some of that story into the landscape and maybe put in storyboards and pictures and link some of these storytelling to actual change in the landscape. And I think it's essential that we do this now because we've got such an opportunity. We could be thinking it's an incredible moment of crisis, but an incredible opportunity to rethink how we move, where we live. And I think this is an incredibly interesting time because we have a huge amount of uncertainty, but we could hold on to the idea of navigating towards a regenerative, sustainable future. And I think so much of my work and my practice is helping make sure that we tell a story of why it is we've got to where we are and how we can reimagine and rethink so that we could have a regenerative, sustainable future. And that comes from this sort of very strong sense of clear science, clear principles that could guide that story. But the story in each place is full of infinite possibility and creativity and nuance. So I think that's this looking for this pattern that connects the place, the people and possibilities for the future.
that's what my practice is about. Great, thank you, thank you, Dawn. That's that's brilliant. Uh, one thing that I find really um, interesting between uh, all the three of you is like how you uh, how you you try to uh, bring these stories, to engage with these stories, and help us understand, like, or look at the the bigger picture and. Mm. I've been thinking about this, uh, you know, the middle kind of uh, words that we have today, technology as well, in terms of like, uh, yeah, tools that we create, uh, and but also who controls these tools. And one thing that um, I think is really important in terms of like how, uh, what, in, what Invisible Flock or like Cassia are doing, uh, but also what you're doing with creating or like these technologies in a, in a different way from like what mm -hmm. we are used to have out there and uh, and it's something that um, I find is really interesting in you know just to look beyond what we are doing here in the west as well I mean Victoria you might have been uh, you, you might have come across um, communities in Sumatra, for example, who are uh, using, like building DIY kind of drones or devices to uh, monitor the environment or like, and, uh, and, and what happens in terms of like the, the destruction of the land for like palm oil uh, plantations. And uh, so, so this is something that I feel that there is a lot more that artists can, but also uh, scientists and um, academics and uh, like thinkers can can contribute to. So it'd be great to uh, yeah just talk a little bit more about how we could yeah just share like make these tools that you are using or like your artistic practices a bit more widely kind of accessible. Or how do we how do we think of of these as a in a, in a bigger much bigger scale? Because I'm always I'm always thinking about kind of our, um, you know, what we've been doing, uh, like talking about these issues and thinking about these issues in a kind of uh, also like, yeah, uh, in, a, in a privileged, but also like bubble kind of way. How do we have these conversations uh, with, with people who have no access to, to these tools or like who have no access to the work that you are doing uh, or like who can't, uh, you know, just, come to galleries and see the, and engage with these ideas. And it's really interesting what you were saying, John, about the landscape and um, using the landscape as a, and to bring these stories to the landscape. And, and this is something that I find fascinating as well. Like how do we maybe, uh, yeah, think about these wider impacts and destruction, but also in nearer to, to our home and our environment and our immediate kind of uh, spaces. Uh, and also just one reminder for uh, everyone who is with us to uh, please feel free to post any questions or comments or provocations in, in the chat, uh, in the Q&A, but also in the chat. So I don't know who wants to go first or like, uh, yeah, just say a, a bit more, share a bit more on this. I can, I just on the, um, what you were saying about uh, access to technologies <clears throat> in a place like Sumatra, for example. Um, the, the field sites where we work, um, they have sort of very little resources, but then I guess what's interesting is the challenge of the site, um, which is both difficult in terms of technology, but I, what you said about site, Joanna, really struck me. I was like, oh, it's, there's actually loads of potential around those, those limitations or the relation with that site as well. So um yeah so like there's no obviously no phone signal or no internet in these these stations where we work so a lot of what the the rangers do in terms of logging um for population counts is to roam and write it down or it's you know it's 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 much more um it's an it's a it is a technology but it's it's responsive to site and sometimes those technologies that we would then bring out bring in are just completely inappropriate they're like they're not usable and I think um I think we always see it as like yeah a technology can come in and it can be a solution but actually it's so site is so specific you know the context is so specific that I think it is that is where you see the more um organic or hacky or more, more kind of innovative solutions that that come out of those spaces and um, I think it's really exciting. Indonesia is particularly exciting for that. 
um anyway I think um yeah I don't have much to say on it but it is I suppose the important of context when we're talking about technologies I could maybe also add to that that um you know the technology itself is not like um the the I, I suppose it depends how the story is um conveyed and shown and what you know because the technology might be used to create a story and the story can be about technology but it doesn't have to be shown using this technology example so it's about you know going out there and and making work which can take different forms and then that way reach different communities um but um you know saying that i've been struggling with quite a lot because it's um you know it's about um in my work i try to not even make a new tools but repurpose you know and whatever it's already available um and see you know how we can hack it um while i really work so much with communities um, as i would like to um you know like like in this vlog i have to learn from you guys <laughs> how to reach out a bit better but you know i've been in places like you know, for example in the gambia and um and, and similarly, like in Sumatra, you know, people, people, people there, they, they kind of um, approach technology is very, very different, and 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 it's but it's also quite amazing because it's about using what is available and um, and making things out of absolutely everything. Nothing goes to waste ever. You know, and, and and so so that's I think we are trying to do in our studio, in my studio, we're trying to kind of, you know, use whatever we have to um to hack and to you know provide a platform um you know, to see, you know, my work also usually use uh, a bio data, so 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 this kind of you know data stream is the is the kind of um this for um for creation of the story and and um, and in terms of uh, creating the, the connection between us and you know non humans you know and and technology this this data is like you know the record um, uh, and uh, yeah and try to release it as open source <laughs> all these ideas I don't know if that is a right answer but I hope it will provide some insight yes thank you so Joan, did you want to i i suppose um one of the things that, that i i think we could be doing here is always thinking as well about action I mean, I'm, I'm quite pragmatic with this about thinking okay well where it, it, have we got a role to say what little bit can we make better here what little bit can we make better here? And this is something that I really learned. I, I was very fortunate. I, I did my PhD with um, John Handley, who founded Groundwork, which is quite a major national, national and international foundation that's transforming post-industrial landscapes. And one of the things he learned very early on, they had this huge vision. Their first landscape was to restore a, a former coal mining. There's always a bit of coal mining in my stories, it seems. A former coal mining site. And but the local people in St. Helens and the local people said, what are you what are you doing for us then, eh? What's this all about? We've got don't care, our lives rubbish anyway. Slightly, I did slightly paraphrase that from what they actually said. And one of the things they did was they got out and just did some litter picking. And I think it's it's make it what we need to do is we've got this sort of huge challenge and we've got to connect, somehow connect these huge major shifts i mean so much of what i would say is nothing we're doing is enough we, we've got to fundamentally rethink everything we're doing but we also have to do something little and small and make something a little better and one of our jobs i think is to link those little things that sense of litter picking you've cleared something up or you've planted a tree here to and we need to fundamentally transform what we're doing so i think part of our practice of connection is probably not just time but it's also about change and that we need to look wherever wherever we can, wherever we're working, what's the little thing we can do to make this a bit better? And what can we inspire people to do to do to in their place to make it a bit better as well? So it, it's sort of always having an action orientation in, in my view. 
So that that's one of the things. And I think it's, it, and it, again, it's that linking the global to the local, global to the local, which is part of what this time thing does. Time helps us do that. And in the, in the chat, I noticed there's a question about how do we get some non-human perspectives? So I just want to quickly share a screen of something that we've been that we've been doing, which is quite interesting. This is, I, and, and I think it's really interesting during during COVID when we can't meet each other very easily. It, we're going to have to think about how we are in our bodies. And this here is school children acting the carbon cycle. So it's again, it's that sort of how do we get different perspectives? Perhaps we have got to put ourselves into those shoes. And in this case, this is children rushing around, being carbon, um, going between the sunshine and the cow and the grass and being carbon. And then in another game, we ask them to be a willow tit traveling through their landscape and they have to just and they get to they have to travel through a destroyed landscape and then recreate a landscape that they can travel through so perhaps we all we all have to expand our imagination and our bodily being in our places and imagine new ways to be and and play with different ways of helping people do that and then i think think about that embodied react reality of what we leave behind and what we can do where we can and obviously we can't always beat ourselves up we can't make everything perfect we can't make all our exhibits or what we do carbon neutral and and with all leaving things better but we could at least have that action orientation in place in our minds as much as we can I think that's really interesting. This um, to to think about actions and uh, what what can we do and why is it relevant to us, and uh, and it's something that sometimes makes me feel that we we need to have more of like good stories from anywhere because we it is quite overwhelming to just hear about. Uh, you know, disasters, but in, in a kind of, uh, in, in an almost kind of dystopian way, but, and then uh, thinking that actually I'm, I'm not, I, I'm powerless, I can't do anything, so I will just sit back and just see the world kind of ending uh, a kind of uh, um, way of, but also just to go back to uh, the idea of like technology and uh, Kat um, in, in the, uh, the Q&A just put a comment about... Uh, Irini, you've gone quiet. Oh, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yep. Yeah? Okay. Sorry for that. So yeah, just thinking about um, going back to technology and uh, referring to what Kat uh, put in the in the Q and A about low tech, but also not thinking about technology, which is actually again it's very important as well. We we tend to kind of think that oh, and, and it's something that we saw with COVID as well that oh, we are going to use. Uh, like uh, data collection or we're going to use these technologies and hacks and etc to find a solution and not thinking uh, from the perspective of the virus as a uh, as a kind of really tiny creature that tries to survive and will find ways to survive in, in a way so it's really interesting uh, I wonder um, Cassia and Victoria if you want to if you have anything to say are um, going back to Gabriella's question in the in the chat thinking about uh, what we can take to engage outside these like human centric perspectives? I think um, I just was going to build a bit on just yeah. build a bit on, ooh, feeding back of what Joanna said. Um, and just again, what you said really about technology. And I was just thinking then about actually, is it about us being able to disrupt? what technology is or how it's thought about you know not just thinking at it as, as product but as something tangible and breakable and remoldable and and I think I think it's really interesting with Invisible Flocks work that we rarely there rarely be like I said an off-the-shelf technology that will do the thing we want it to do but I think quite often the the corporations or the people who sell those products you know we, we've had relationships with Sony about this project um, they're really interested in the disruption of, of that technology so I think yeah I think that's partly an interesting political role <laughs> um, for us as artists to really challenge like you said what does it mean that the same drone that maps the palm plantations is used to look at reforestation um, 
yeah, what does that mean? And and who owns that product? And how did we how do we slightly disrupt it or you know use it in just a different way that make, makes people think about that? Um, and in terms of yeah, how we embody non-human perspectives, I think for me, like personally, it's been um, there's there's a great line. I can't remember the the, the author now. I think it's David Haskell, possibly. It's about cross species listing. So really, you know, for me, I love animals and I, I love spending time in nature, but just actually embodying that or having a relationship with another species, looking in the eye, um, you know, and that doesn't have to be an elephant, that could be <laughs> a hedgehog, you know, there's, it's like Joanna says, you know, it can be in your backyard. Um, but I think that's, that is about embodiment and it's about, it is about thinking about spending that time in that way and that's really that's really valuable and I think for me that does a lot of what you're talking about Irene around kind of this despair as well you know and and I think when when Covid obviously hit and we were all freaking out you know I think why people were so amazed with the the birds like chirping louder than ever is that that is this thing they they don't know like that they're going about their days and that brilliant and I think yeah just just stepping outside of you know our own time and our own schedules just for a moment each day um and and imagining yeah another life or another species and how how they're perceiving the world and that is just a simple exercise i think yeah i would like to add to that uh, um i mean in general i feel that it's um as, as gabrielle actually said we are looking at the world um we are perceiving the world through our human lens and uh, it is impossible it's it's actually impossible to get out of our own world we will never know what uh, a fish or or a arrow will you know feels or or you know what are um these sensations but about um i think um so it's kind of uh, in relation to both the non-human perspective perspective and and technology is about you know from my in my practice what i try to do is to look at how technology can, if i have to use technology how technology can help me to um evoke uh convey that the empathy which i might feel towards different non-human makers as i call them and um and also whether it cannot be in real life somewhere, whether technology can help me to bring things to my field of view, because as soon as there is something in our field of view, knowledge it and we can start caring for it. And, and you know, we have, you know, we have it in their presence. And, and I think, you know, those are the basics which, and exercises which we can do you know, to start um, engaging uh, um, with environment and, and hopefully healing our relationship. Thank you. Uh, which makes me think also uh, again to um, your, to what you do as artists, but also this applies to you, John, as well, in using creative ways to engage with these yeah, issues. And some, like most of the time, we don't think about, for example, artistic practices in this way. We don't think that uh, art can engage with, uh, with with scientific issues or like with ecological issues or with an or with just going or an involving going out to remote uh, sites and uh, gathering data or uh, thinking about like animal welfare or scanning the environment etc and i think in the uk we've been really lucky that it's uh, it's quite it's almost it's quite common to have this uh, cross sector collaborations and disciplines coming together and working together like scientists with artists with technologies with engineers uh, yeah, uh, academics, etc. So I would I would love to hear because a lot of the time we do talk at future everything, but also now thinking about arts electronica, there is so many conversations going about their all the role of art in society, the role of art in uh, in the pandemic. These ideas of like what you mentioned also, uh, Cassia, about caring, which is a really interesting word for me, and it's really important to think about 
ideas of like uh, maintenance, right? For 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 what we have and and care, but also. Uh, not just like, of course, with other uh, across like the uh, environments and ecologies and species, but also between humans as well. And it's something that for me, uh, artists have been uh, uh, like reminding us and dealing with for for a very long time. And it's just now that we're starting to to realize. So I think it'd be great to. Um, I would love to hear um, all of you think. Yeah, just sharing about what what you why you think uh, art can have this uh, role and why it is important and uh, and how we could how we can make this how can we amplify that and because it's not we we are you know in a privileged position here to think like that it doesn't mean that that's the norm of like engaging in collaborations or like having artists to think you know just to go out to to the wild and doing research like that so i would love to hear that Who wants to go first? Victoria, do you okay. want to start? Yeah. Or John? Uh, yeah, John. Okay, I'll keep going. Okay, okay. I, I, I think it's also a really interesting time to think about the role of art because I, I, obviously on one level, so many artistic venues and endeavors are under threat because we can't get together with the, the, the and and it's, it's it's often one of those things that goes isn't it it's like well it's 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 not necessarily seen as absolutely essential to 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 keeping life going therefore is this what we're going to fund but i think what's has come out strongly from these last few months is people's need for meaning people's need for story and connection and i think i think there's a there's an interesting role to play there about something about helping people understand their place and their ro and their role and, and and i think i think that this sense of engagement and conversation is really important so it, it, it's it, 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 where we've had these amazing collaborations and the work that that that, that i've been doing with you with future flock um, future flock sorry future everything and invisible flock <laughs> There you go, new name. They are very good friends, so it's nice to merge. Like <laughs> yeah, next project, um, it, it it was having that time to have those conversations to build the links where we could explore ideas in more depth, and I think all of us got pushed in some way in some new dimension of thinking that came out of that conversation, and so I think we need to think of artistic practice as this process as well and then sometimes there is a product or a a, ga a a thing in a gallery a soundscape or something then it's can we how can we engage more conversations with people after they've seen it or during in in it it might be in it or it might be after it how do we try and prolong that sense of the dialogue about what this meant what this means how we got there and what we could do with this new knowledge to me it's a, a lot about dialogue and conversation and that might be the way that we can sort of really anchor in people's minds the importance of art it's let's use this to help us reimagine and tell our story so that that's it, it's it's making sure we get that time and we make that time for those conversations before during and after to me i totally agree with you i think you've hit the nail on the head there for, for me as well it's about the process so two things you're only as good as your collaborators it's not about the artist going to help the scientist who doesn't know what to do with his data and how you know it's it's about a knowledge exchange and I think um the reason I I find field work so satisfying is every new person I meet is living a different reality that you know they're thinking about the world in in a different way and there's this just amazing thing that happens of knowledge exchange exactly what you're saying Joanna of conversation and then through that process I mean our, our processes with our work tend to now be two three years and like you're saying the artwork at the end or wherever it is might be one element but it's certainly not the most important or where I feel like the most impact necessarily has had I think it's part of a long process um yeah so uh and I was gonna I think that's why with um the out from the flood project I mentioned right at the beginning we've started to try and bring that a little bit more um into our work more actively and um because of covid like putting something online that isn't finished and taking kind of a more indie game approach to something which is like it's not a product it's it's not perfect have a look at it it will evolve it's a conversation exactly 
um, yeah, it's, it, I think that really excites me as a way of where art is, is moving. And I would like to add to it as well, because of course I live with both John and Victoria, um, but um, yeah, for me also it's about considering it as a sort of um, a social practice, an environmental practice. So it's more kind of holistic about making a product really, or an installation, but using it as a sort of um, pretext um, for, for, for um, demonstrating and inviting people to experience new social, um, ethical, environmental um, uh, worlds or, or alternative scenarios, especially because you know we know that the last few months very clearly showed us that the way we're living, you know, our lives, especially in the Western world, is is not good, but there's nowhere out there a one authority which would show us all the scenario. And so everybody is at the moment in this kind of, I don't know, suspended animation. I don't really know where to move. And I think, you know, as, as Joanna and Victoria, you both said, us is really amazing role right now because it will help us. Hopefully it will help people to uh, find the meaning and, and find the position and find the role. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that's great. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think process is a really important um, uh, idea and it's something that I, I was also thinking about uh, like in, in terms of like how do we move forward and make things happen in, in, a, in a gallery space now, especially now and thinking about this idea of like, why do we need, yeah, all this time we've been kind of, uh, yeah, artists have been under pressure, but also curators and museums and art spaces to put like a product into a space to share, but what if we think in a different way in terms of uh, sharing processes and thinking and having this approach of, um, of like ongoing labs in a way, or like doing like this, you know, these actions that we can work towards like together. Uh, yeah, so so that's that's a, I think that's a really important uh, approach and perspective. And I'm just we have one last question from uh, from Kathy uh, saying, how do you reveal? Oops, what happened to it? I've missed it. How do you um, how do you reveal um, those processes to make the difference to policy funders to buy the time to explore and engage and make those small changes add up? Which is a really interesting. Um, uh, question and uh, Joan, you did say you wish you had the answer. <laughs> oh, yeah, I apologize. I didn't. I've I've just learned something about Zoom. When you answer it, it disappears. <laughs> and I was answering, saying, I wish I knew. <laughs> but I, I suppose it. I suppose it's um. We, part of what we've got to do is. I I, I I think we probably have to play a bit of a game as well and make sure that we 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 do show that there will be the product, the thing that people get. I, I suspect that we, we, I think we've almost got to be careful that we don't lose ourselves in the talk of the process to the point where funders think, well, that's just going to be a bunch of chat then, isn't it? And there's going to be nothing we can see and we can tick a box with. So I suspect we've got to be quite clever in, in making sure that we have, and, and I, I, something that I thought about, Victoria, with what you were saying there was almost, I wonder if we had, should have, be quite clever with having phases where we say here here's here's a product here's something in a gallery here's the phase that we can look at and make sure that we flag that is it and say look here's here's something right now we have a bit more conversation look here's something so we almost build we need to build it in to what we're doing and we may need to be quite cunning about how we do that by making sure that people can see some of what they're expecting and just sort of build in some of the rest. That, that's my first thought. Um, I think the, the, the policymaker uh, question is something I, I, I always ask when I'm being a participant in these things, because I also, I think when we first met Joanna, I think I asked you guys the same question. Um, it feels like this, you know, hidden away <laughs> uh, aim, but I think, um, so, so I guess Ways Invisible Flock are trying to do that is through the openness of the data. 
um, which I guess because we're not academics, we can move with certain more fluidity and speed around these things. So for example, um, any of the data we, we will capture through the Sumatra project um, around where the primates are, or you know that all that will just be given to the NGOs and they can then use it to lobby for the protection of that land. Um, so again, like a postponed version of, of that that we were, were hopefully going back to was to map a very specific elephant migratory cor corridor in Aceh. And again, if we could show enough of those elephants passing, then that, that's data that they can then use to lobby to the government. And um, because those NGOs have those links, it's just they don't necessarily have the tools or the time um, to, to put it into place. So I guess we see it as that's a really exciting role. You know, it's, it's um, I feel useful in that solution. Um, so I think, yeah, I think we've been trying to find ways in which, in which what the, I think how artists do or don't have freedom within these systems, I think we can kind of sneak into different spaces and, and, and yeah, be really useful and then disappear again and again. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I just also would like to add to that, that, um, you know, it's not um, only about uh, artists and scientists and gathering data and information and then sharing it with the, uh, the local, you know, counseling bodies, but also or maybe for me, maybe it's even more important, you know, through our practices, we um, we share stories about issues and the problems the uh, local communities and societies, giving them vocabulary and tools. So then they can are kind of armed, that empowered and armed with, you know, the, um, the knowledge and the tools to, to go and fight for their rights because they know about these issues. And I think that's how it's very, very important and it shouldn't be overlooked. Thank you all so much. Uh, I just, we, we've got just a, a few minutes uh, left. So, so we, we're going to uh, go towards a close. I just wanted to mention um, uh, Irini's comment, Irini from the island uh, next to the one I'm here. <laughs> I mean, uh, just uh, the, the story about like the um, currently the wind turbines uh, in, in this uh, in the Cycladis and it's something that I've seen here in Andros when I arrived as well and a lot of protests going about that uh, and uh, she, she mentions like that kind of uh, being kind of um, uh, implemented as a as a sustainable source of energy while on the other hand a lot of um, citizens and inhabitants being uh, worrying about like the the uh, the animals and like the the birds and the safety uh, yeah the safety of like the, these the non-human kind of uh, agents in a way and uh, and yeah the the kind of like division there but also the story uh, as as Joanne was uh, saying the the story that is offering reasons but also an urge for everyone to like uh, research and and create. So I don't know if anyone has uh, any uh, any kind of comment or like anything to, to say to uh, to Irini, but uh, I just if not, um, uh, I just wanted to kind of to, to take if you have any final uh, sharings or, or 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 things to say before we uh, we close the session. I suppose one of the things is I was thinking about that idea of the wind turbine of the local, this is where we, we need to have some quite difficult conversations about what the future of our landscapes and spaces look like. But the trouble is we need to have them together. I, I think one of the things that I'm really concerned about is the fragmentation that we're seeing that when we're not meeting and we don't have that collaborative action that we might be losing sight of the bigger picture. And I think that's a real role for us to think about is how do we make sure we do that have these conversations with many, many people together and say, what are the pluses and minuses? That's a challenge. I'm afraid I haven't got an answer, but it's clearly that we need to have those conversations. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, um, I'm always just really wary of catch all sustainable solutions. Um, and again, we should remind ourselves that those products are designed and sold. And um, I don't know if anyone saw the I think the article in the Guardian this week, um, someone sent to me about um, planting schemes and um, how quick planting carbon capture forests could actually be more dangerous in terms of biodiversity. So it's more just a, a, an ending note that I think, again, as artists and practitioners and people, we just always need to go back, do a check, rethink it. And, and then like you say, Joanne, 
ask around, talk to other people. And I suppose um, we um, need to um, try not to escape um, from complexities, um, because I think that we all here are talking about extremely complex and interconnected issues. And uh, what we usually observe you know, in, in media um, are all these simplified informations and informations. And I think here again, to kind of come back to the role of art, within all of that is um, highlights those complexities and, and bring them forward again, engage people to immerse themselves in them and not escape from them. Great, thank you all so much for being here this morning. It's been such a pleasure talking to you and I know we're not, we're going to continue with these conversations and, and uh, yeah, planning and uh, working together, so I'm, I can't wait for that. Uh, it, it's been so inspirational to hear about your work and I hope uh, everybody who's uh, joined us has enjoyed the session. It's such a, it, it's so great to have you all here. Thank you for, for joining us. I'm just going to uh, put in the, um, in the chat just uh, two links uh, the, uh, about the uh, Ars Electronica Kepler's Gardens uh, UK hub that we are part of uh, in case you want to check out the other events. And we have the second part of the, of the session happening this afternoon at from four o'clock to, yeah, four to five. And finally, um, the other link is from the, the Starts, uh, the European uh, kind of initiative that is uh, exploring uh, cross-sector collaboration. So, and uh, Cassia has done some work, has yeah, produced some work for that and residency. So check out the uh, other artists and scientists working on that. And yeah, thank you. Thank you again for, for being here. And uh, yeah, and please stay in touch and hopefully we can, we can come back to Future Focus for, for more. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.